Very good. That's how we roll. So today we're going to have an excellent class where I'm going to struggle with a MacBook and then I'm going to throw it out the air and insist that uh, this thing gets reformatted with an operating system that's not horrendous. Are you going to need a pineapple pizza? Okay, so we're going to shout out questions that are very, very basic about basic OS X operation. You're going to answer them and then we're going to cover Python. First question, how do we make fonts bigger on a Mac? On a Windows it's Control Plus. On a Mac it's... Command plus. Command, command, plus. Plus. command plus. Okay. I'm doing no. command. I'm doing plus. No. Yeah, command plus. plus. Yeah, I think you have to go to the settings for those. Wow. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's fun. Okay. You've done it before on the Linux side. Settings I think. where? Oh, pff. Right, we'll find window. Window. Let's try window. Okay. We got, we got one at a time in the back. File. File. Oh, that's a good place to make a font bigger. Okay. File. Uh, settings. File settings. Project structure, maybe. Project Some structure settings, or settings repository? No. Preferences. Oh. Huh. <laughs> yeah, come on. How many, uh. This is a PyCharm. PyCharm? Preferences? Yes. Okay. That makes more sense with file. I'll give it to him. Where do I see it? Under editor, I see something about fonts. Well, there's two places. For right the in this, line. the screen you were just at. Okay. Oh, he wants the screen that I just said. Yeah. So you said you use custom font? Custom font, yeah. And then up to size. Okay. That'll do, that'll do everything but the code. Okay. And then you have, yeah, that one's for the code. Make it spicy. How's that? Can we read it? No. Yeah. Make it bigger. Make it smaller. <laughs> Smaller. That's not the direction we're going to be going today. Go big or squint. That's a, that's a there we go. Can we read that? Yes. yes. Okay, we'll monkey around that code later and I'm sure it'll be a total catastrophe. <laughs> Let's play. So today we're going to be covering uh, the name of the chapter is Reading and Writing Files. Let's see if I can make that one. Oh, that one is logical. Good job, OSX. You pulled it off. <laughs> Impressive. Okay, so uh, we've covered in the last class, we covered regexes. Regex is, regexes give us the ability to manipulate strings. So if we have a string, right? Anyone here want to summarize what a string is? Hint, not a thread. An array of alphanumerics. There we go, that's a little complex and it's not just alphanumerics. It's a bunch of things, right? So characters, usually, right? That's how you can refer to strings. Uh, you have, you can have periods in there, you can have parentheses in there, spaces are characters too, all of that stuff. When you see a piece of it, we call that a string. A piece of memory is a string. And we talked about in the last class how we can take those strings and we can apply regex operations on them, right? So by that we can take it, we can do grouping, Right? We talked about it. How do you make a regex in Python? Does anyone remember? Compile. Of course. It's okay if you don't remember. I didn't teach that class. <laughs> <laughs> I won't take it personal. Anyone else want to give it a shot? Import re. Import re, exactly. And then what do we say? We say re dot what? Compile. Exactly. Bada boom. Well done. All right. And then uh, we, we showed how that was an object, right? So now we have a regex object. And when we have a regex object, we can call on that object what method to apply it to text. And remember that one. Search, find all. Search, exactly. Uh, Search and find all. There we go. Or two of them. There we go. Yep, there's a couple more. Now let's say that you go, ah, shit. Let me find out what all the uh, regex module can do. How are you going to find that out? Point. Help. Help, right? Help, and what are we going to feed the help? RE. Right, and RE is in Python. We call that a? Module. A module, but what does Python want to call it? Class name, right? So if you look at it, uh, it's actually the name of a class. We have this class. It is a module, that is exactly right. You can call them, they are almost interchangeable. Uh, but let me show you what we have. And again, by the way, this, just so everyone knows, and everyone has a disclaimer, this is my first day with a MacBook. And whatever smooth is, this is the opposite. I would say rough, but that does it, uh, doesn't do it justice. Okay, here's another application that God did not want to make bigger with plus. 
Let me see here. Uh, kitty preferences. Okay. Window? <coughs> dun, dun, dun. Here we Anyway, I have a terminal already up. Will this one work with plus? Oh, oh. Okay, control shift. That's that's brilliant. Okay. So we can go here, we can go to import RE, and then we can say help, and we can say RE, right? And we give it a class name, and we see here, actually, this is this is this is listing as a module. I would have thought it would say class name, but no. Uh, so this is a, a, a module, and it has a bunch of things it can do, and I just want to show you really quickly how that works and what that looks like. This is a quick overview of the syntax of the regular expressions. So we went over a lot of this stuff in the last class, but we didn't go over everything. And we didn't go over everything, and we will never go over everything, because the name of the book is Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, not everything about Python regexes. So if you're doing something that is regex intensive, and you want to learn more about them, Read the official docs, because there's a lot more that we didn't cover. Uh, but if you want to remember what those, those well, like here, without looking, what is uh, forward slash s? Remember, remember that one from last class? That's right. Everyone's got it right. Every, any kind of space character. So we're talking about spaces, new lines, and tabs, all of that kind of stuff, right? So if you ever forget it and you want to find it again, you just say help re, and you can read the man pages for that. I like to stress this all the time because I know too many developers that don't know how to read man pages and it's painful for them and me working with them. So uh, this makes your life a lot easier. <coughs> you can see here that these are the functions that we talked about. I asked before and Eddie said full match and he said match and there we go. Full match and match are right there. So these are different things that we can do with uh, functions that are inside of this, this module. Oop. The keys are even in a weird place. Uh, yeah, let's see here. And then here's a list of the classes that we actually have over there. Yeah, so play around with the man pages. I still learn about them. They're not all easy to use, but some of them are. And I think it's a good starting point. And if you ever want like the full unabridged Python things, you want to like get, get deep dive into all the Python docs, the website is actually great and it has everything you're looking at here. So if you like web browsers, check it out. All right, so. Today what we're covering is reading and writing files, and we start off with this thing called a file path, right? So what is a file path? Well, computers have addresses for everything that's on that computer, everything that's on your hard disk, I should say, be specific. And that address is essentially a file path, right? So uh, if you've ever done with addresses that are humans use, you find that they are a tremendous mess, right? Uh, if you here, Golden can also be GLD. That's a U.S. Post Office uh, abbreviation for it. There's a lot of different ways to write things and a lot of different ways to do things. So one of the things that we do with uh, good programmers, anyway, is we kind of standardize it. And most files on a computer can be displayed hierarchically, right? That's the word. So we have inside of the C drive a directory called users, inside of users a directory called as Weinscar, inside of that a directory called projects, and then we have our destination, which is projects.docx. And you're going to find different terms here to describe the structure. So we call the first directory root, right? We call the thing right here at the end, that is the file you're seeking to, right? And all of this stuff here, users, as WiseGuard and documents, all of this makes your path, right? So path is where it is, whatever you're looking for can be found. And then the last thing we just usually call that a file. Now here you'll see here the C colon forward slash part of the path is the root folder. Uh, folders is a Windows thing. In any context when you're talking to computer programmers, you can generally speaking replace folder with directory and sound smarter. Uh, you know, I don't think it's actually pretentious either. It's a pretty not pretentious word, directory, because uh, it's everywhere. But yes, it, it does, it, it sounds better than folders. And we also don't have trash cans, by the way. That is another, another fancy folder or directory. So uh, backslash and forward slash on Windows and OS X. We talk about how uh, some of these things we have like these abbreviations in, in English with our addresses and they change. Well computers have the same type of things in some areas, right? Like we've already established that Macintosh is an inferior piece of hardware and software. <laughs> Uh, a lot of the reasons that I feel that way is because it simply wants to change things just for shits and giggles. 
Well, here are some things that you find that are changed for shits and giggles across platforms. You'll, and there's historical reasons for this, by the way, which are very entertaining, but we're going to leave those aside because I don't want to rent about them. But here we have this thing, <laughs> os.path.join, user bin spam. And you'll see it returns this here, right? User bin spam. Now, it doesn't have to return that. On a different system, it'll return those slashes in a different way. Why? Because Windows users will write their slashes differently than Linux users will. And the real idea of which platforms write them which ways is pretty silly, and it's really tangential. But the point that you really need to know is that you can construct a cross-platform path using this module, right? OS has this os.path, which has a method in there, a function called join. And the sole purpose of join is to handle all of those questions about how do I do this on Windows, how do I do this on Linux, how do I do this on BSD, and get rid of all of those differences so you don't have to worry about them. That's really convenient. So every different programming language will have something similar to os.path, and I suggest you use it, because then you don't ever have to learn about which is the right way for every platform. I'll give you a case in point. Myself, I write software for, for Linux, right? I write software on Linux for Linux only. But I always write my software with things like os.path.join, right? So when I take something, like, let me give you a case in point. I'm writing a, a Python module, and inside that Python module, I'm shipping out uh, 10 images, right? So I put them all into this image folder. Now I want to have a method of accessing those images from the module that I'm shipping out to different people. Some of those people are going to be on Windows, and some of those poor folks are going to be sitting in that latte shop having paid way too much for their hardware. <laughs> So the thing here is that when you when you want to work with that type of environment where it's, it's different people and you know they have different things and uh, you write it like this and I just know it works. I can say inside of this directory is a file and that file that I'm oh that's wanting to sleep on me inside of that file is something called this image dot png. That's what I'm looking for. Go into this directory, find me this file, and it takes care of the slash directions. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay. And that's really all there is to os.path.join. When you work with a computer, right, you always have this notion of what directory you're in. Does anyone here use command line? Some people don't. Wait, when you say command line, you mean in a Windows system? In any system, yeah. Oh. Okay. So <laughs> let's say that you're, you're using command line, and then here's one thing, here's one thing that Windows unscrew itself up with, which is nice. Uh, if you want to, let's say you're in a directory, right? And inside of that directory, there's another directory. It's called images. That's got all those images we just created. Let's say you want to go into it. How do you do it? CD, I, tab. CD, right? That's the, the key. What does CD stand? Now, if you, let me say this. If you've been coming to this group for six months, don't answer this question. <laughs> what does CD stand for? Change, change directory. Change directory, that's right. So your computer has a notion of a directory, right? And it gives you the ability to change into a different directory. That's all that that means. So in Python, we can find out what directory we're in using this, get CWD. That's get current working directory, right? So you don't know what directory your application starts in. I call my program foo.py. Copy that file all over. I can have it in the C drive. I can have it in the D drive. I can have it in the Windows directory. I can have it in users, whatever, because Apple doesn't like a user directory. You can do all of that kind of stuff, and your computer program can find out where it's at by asking the operating system, which current working directory <coughs> am I in? Right? OK, and why is that useful? It's useful for this. How many people know how to remove a file with the command line? Right? Now here's where you get to find out which operating system they're using without asking the question. It's pretty sly. Uh, okay, let's go in the back corner of the blue blue jacket. In, that, in the green jacket, I'm sorry. I, I lost my colors there. In the green jacket, <laughs> what, is, what is the command used to delete a file? It depends on when I'm working with the system already. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> right now on your system. RM. There you go. So you know what? It's either Linux or Unix. Right, so RM is the Linux or Unix command. Or Mac. Well, Mac is what? Darwin, which is what? BSD. So, yes. 
BSD based Linux Unix, uh, you know she's not using uh, a Microsoft product, right? So RM is or am I? <laughs> <laughs> because she could be using a Microsoft product that's you know running a Linux subsystem or something crazy. These days that gets pretty insane. But the point that I'm trying to make here is is that on these types of commands it's different, right? So we have RM, we have uh, we have Dell if you're a DOS user or a Windows user, God forbid, whatever else. But the, the point here is, is that when we issue that command, when we say rm file, right, the computer is going to use the current working directory to figure out what file you want to remove. Because you can have that file in 10 different directories, right? So it has, to know, it has to know where it's at. Because you're not telling it exactly where that file is at, right? It says where I'm at is in this directory. And I'm looking in this directory for a file called foo. Right? Now that's an important distinction. Because you have two methods of addressing something. And this is very common, right? You can address a file by telling the computer, if we go up to the very top, right? Oh, here we go. I like this. This is good. I was going to show you my own example, but they've done one for me. You can tell the computer where a file is at by specifying C, bacon, fizz, spam. There's only ever going to be one of those files, right? But if I use something like this, fizz spam, right? Then it assumes I am in bacon. Right? And if I'm not in bacon and I'm in a different file, I could get a different spam. Does that make sense to everyone? If you don't give it the root, you don't start at the root when you're doing your addressing. You don't start off with C colon forward slash if you're a Windows user or the slash if you're a uh, same person. You don't start off with those types of things. Then your, your computer could potentially return more than one file. It could get confused. Right? So what it does to stop that confusion is it says, from the, the directory I'm currently at. And that's what this current working directory business is all about. Okay, so we know now how to get the current working directory, os.getcwd, and I'm gonna show off some of that stuff here. Do, 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 import os, os.getcwd, and you can find out where I'm at. I'm in my own home directory. Uh, and if we ever forget, Good question, because we're going to always do this until people absolutely have it drilled into their head. If I want to find out what other cool stuff OS can do, what do I type? Help OS. Yeah. Help OS, right? Help OS. Oh, without that, I learned the keyboard. OS routines for NT and POSIX, depending on what system we're on, right? This is cool. We've seen a lot of stuff here. We're seeing here that this is actually different on each system. The implementation is different, right? So if you're on Windows or on Linux, they write the inside functions, these functions that say, how do I delete a file? These functions at the core level are written differently. Right? Python has done that for you, so you don't have to worry about that crap. Because that is a nightmare. So when I ship something to someone and it's a Python module, and I say, Python, delete this file. Python says to itself, I'm on <coughs> Windows. I know how to delete a file on Windows, I call Dev. I'm on Linux, I know how to delete a file on Linux, I call RM. Python knows that, so you don't have to. It's the same thing with the path, right? These are file system abstractions, right? So I'm here in this OS module, and it's telling me right there that it knows how to handle other systems. It knows how to handle NT or POSIX. By the way, POSIX is a really fancy way of saying a lot of things that are Linux-y, right? So there's a standard out there, and I'm not going to go into this because I don't like to get too far into the rabbit hole, but there's a standard out there that a bunch of people follow. It's called POSIX, and that includes things like Linux, for the most part, PSD and, and Unix and all of those types of things. You'll find them all very similar. And one of the reasons why they're similar is because they all adhere to the standard. And there are certainly violations, but we're not doing that. Uh, so we can see some more of the, the things that we have here. Notice how we have path set. That's what those programmers that take this OS module and they port them to Windows and Linux, and that's the kind of shit that they have to handle. They have to tell the module, look, the path separator for this operating system is a forward slash. It could be something crazy. You could port Python to a, a file system that uses a, a dash instead, you know? Or L is a path separator, it doesn't matter. Uh, and they're gonna set these variables for you. So if you ever wanna find them, and you want your code to run on different platforms, you can look here. You can find all of this cool stuff. And this, by the way, this is something you want to use. And when you want to become a junior level Python programmer, if you're doing a job application, you definitely want to use this, right? 
Because this is something that even a junior level programmer is expected to like know when you get into Python. You're gonna you're gonna want to know how to use the OS module. Okay. So we have this idea we can get the current directory, right? And we can change the directory, right? So when you're on the command line, I said, how do we do it? And everyone said CD. Ah, that's cute. But the actual method call that every library is going to be using is chdir, right? Change directory. And interestingly enough, I don't know of any operating system that ever implemented that as the command. They all have said CD. But uh, yeah, so you can say chdir, and that's going to give you this as your working directory. And now, when you run your commands, dir, ls, or rm, or del, it's going to be looking at your new current working directory rather than wherever you came. OK, and here's another case, too. If you can't get into that working directory, you've got a problem, right? If you try to get into a directory that doesn't exist, Python's going to say, hey, you're an idiot, I can't go there. And it's important that Python tells you that you're an idiot, you can't go there, because if you want to delete files and you're in a directory that doesn't exist, only bad things can happen. So at the point that you try to get into a directory that doesn't exist, you as a programmer have got to say, if my user gets to choose where I'm going, I better do something intelligent, right? Because it's going to be really bad if they think they're in that directory and they start deleting shit. So Python handles it for you. OK. Uh, creating new folders with OS makers. OK. It, it, this is nothing's getting more complex here. We're just going to how to do stuff on a file system with Python. So there is a method to make directories on Python called os.makedirs. Notice this is take this is creating you your directory delicious walnut and waffles. It's doing it deeply, right? Uh, that's really cool. If you work with lower level languages, you'll know why that's cool, and we won't go into it. But it's very simple to use, and it's very nice, and that's how it's supposed to be. OS path module, okay, so we just hit it, we talked about the importance of the path. Why are we, what, did it revert to the old stuff? Okay, we have this, this OS.path thing. The, the path, the OS.path, the OS.path module has in it a lot of different methods, right? And we're gonna go ahead and look at some of them here. I think we covered, no, we didn't cover these. We have this thing called absolute path, right? And what absolute path does is if you give it a relative path, absolute path will return the string of the absolute path. How does it do that? Well, it's going to take the wherever you're at and whatever you've given it, and it knows how to take both of those two things, mix them together, and return to you the absolute path, right? And why is that useful? It's useful because if you're doing something like logging, Right? You want to know where, whatever it is, through the error. You can use something like absolute path and you know it in perpetuity, forever and ever and ever, no matter how the users move their files, this is what caused the problem. Right? Or this is where the file was originally uploaded. And then if you change that directory somewhere later, you know this is where whatever happened. You have this other thing called here IS absolute path. And this, this, this is the, the is predicates, right? We've seen this. Where did we see is predicates before? Is lowercase, is capital. Ah, yeah, and strings, right? Everyone remembers that. We had different methods of looking at a string, and we could see whether something was even title case. There's an is title case, right, in Python, if I remember right. I, I was shocked at that, because really, I mean, who needs to check if something's title case? If you want a title case, just make it title case. But Python has a bunch of these things. They call them predicates, and all they do is if it starts with is, the convention here is that it's going to return what? A boolean. A boolean, right? So you can just drop it right into a conditional. If it starts with is, you're going to get a boolean. That's what you need to know. It's called a predicate. That's a fancy term for saying that that's what it does. So it can tell you whether or not it is an absolute path. And then we can say here, calling os.path.relpath, right, with a path and a start, we'll return the string of the relative path from the start path to path. Okay. That sounds complex, it's really not. OS.path.absolute path assumes the path you're in. Right? So if I say file, and I'm in a directory called foo, it's going to return to me foo file. Right? OS.path.rel path, right, I can give it any file name or path, relative path, 
and a starting point, and it'll do the work for me. Right? And then there you see, if start is not provided, the current working directory is used as a path. If the current working directory is used as a path, it's effectively the same as called an os.path.absolute path. Okay. So we see here os.path.absolute path, period. Right? Now we're getting into something different. You may not have seen this, but you will see this all over the place. Period means the current directory. One dot means the current directory. Here's a test for you. What does two dots mean? Current directory. Previous directory. Uh, not previous. Current uh, 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 directory. Aha! There you go. That's the right word for it. Not current, not previous, parent. Right? That means you're going to go up. That's the right way to think of it, right? Because you always model directories in graphics or in your head as a hierarchy. So you go down, right? And when you want to go up a directory, you use dot dot. That's the computer notion, right? Now, how many people here know how to go up a directory on MacBook? <laughs> Look at that. I see way more MacBooks than hands. That's fascinating to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point here. I, I, I actually just asked that question before the class started, and I have no idea what the answer was. It was insane. Let me show you something here. This is why you can, you can be a professional computer developer and still not know how to use this crap. I come down here and I say, Finder? Just click on the desktop and hit you're Apple on, in. You're on you're, this is where's the, the Where's the file browser? Hit Apple in. Upper left. Okay, Apple N. For okay, new window. I'm here. Okay, I'm here. Okay. How do I go you up can, a directory? You can add, you have to add it. It's so not on by default. The the top of the bar. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm going up. You have to add it. Go to the very top of the bar. Top yeah. of the bar here. Then center. The name of the folder is recent. Oh, uh, hold on. Listen, because this is the guy who knows the Center the screen. Center the screen. Yes. You see it recent. Look at yes. that. Right click. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, or control level. I, 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 I'm not down that I'm, I'm absolutely you, stupid and I can't figure Are you two finger tapping? Is that, it's doing something. I don't, it's just showing me this. Like for me it it's because of that, right. recent's not an actual directory. Okay, so if you command up arrow, it'll go navigate up the hierarchy. Command up arrow. Oh. But yeah. recents isn't like a real directory, I don't think. Okay, so one yeah, recents is a real directory. Here. Try it on desktop. That recents is, is a directory somewhere, or I think. I don't know. No, so it's, uh, like it's like a So it opens up a new. But here's the point. This is why you can be a well-paid and very professional developer and struggle to figure out the shit your grandmother does, right? Go to documents. That's a folder. Go to a real folder. Okay, I'm in a real folder. Now if you command up arrow, it'll command up arrow. Okay. Okay, okay I like that. So let me try this. If I do this and I what I'm double yeah, clicking. Yeah, this, and if you control click. left click, it'll show you the higher, the whole path. The whole path. And you can customize That's cool. Okay, so now we know how to so then you you were right, but then the, the reason is that this is a bullshit folder and you're not screwed. And I'm halfway happy with that because I didn't know it and yeah. that's that's OS X interface for you. So yeah. This is what my whole day has been like, day number one of a Mac. <laughs> and here's the cool thing about it, right? And they've done some research on this. This is a tangent I will go into. Because I don't mind tangents so long as everyone can follow them and they're somewhat inclusive. They did some research on, on actual interfaces, right? And what they found is that it is easier to describe to your grandmother how to use DOS and how to use a modern operating system. And the reason for it is this. The reason for, and I know that sounds totally bizarre because if I put a kid in front of a DOS machine, nothing is intuitive. But here's the reason why it's easier. And this to me, I was like, oh, that makes sense. There's something with that. With DOS, there's one input, one output. You say, where are you at? What are you looking at on that line? And what are you going to type in? And you can figure it all out. Right? CD dot dot. Everyone knows that. There's no special directory or anything like that. So there's like some, there's a very simple thing to that, right? That's a very simple process. Now, configuring a machine in DOS, there may be a thousand steps because what GUIs have made really nice and easy and fleshed out, you may have to do a lot more things in DOS, but it's procedural. Do this, then do that, then do this, then do that. Whereas you saw what just happened when I said, how do I go up a directory? You know, there's 10,000 different ways to do it. There's special directories. There's, you know, it's popping new windows up at me. Yeah. So on a computer, when you're programming, and you want to have the you want to tell a path how to go up the directory. It's far easier than it was telling me how to operate OS X. Use two dots. Two dots, you go up. That's all there is to it. Okay, moving on. Uh, this relative path stuff, right? Let's take a look at this. We have this thing, C Windows, right? 
And what we want to do is, well, let's go up here. Let's show you this. Calling OS.rel path, path start, will return the string of a relative path from the start path to path. This is the start, and this is where we're going. We say OS.path rel path, we're starting in C, and we want to get the path to C windows, right? So if we're starting in this directory, which is essentially the root directory, which is essentially the drive, C, we're starting in the C drive, and we want to get to C windows, right? What do we do? We need to go here. That's the relative path it's returning. That's what you would feed to CD to get there. Does that make sense to everyone? It's not really complex at all. You just got to get used to having this notion of relative paths and absolute paths. And after you figure it out, it's golden. We have this one here, os.path, rel path. We're starting in C spam eggs. That's where we're running this command. And we want to get to C windows. What do we have to do? We have to go up a directory. Then we have to go up one more directory. Then we have to go into windows. Right? So when you want to go up a directory, then up another directory, what do you do? cd dot dot, and then slash, and then dot dot, right? Dot dot, slash dot dot. So when you when you have that, that dot dot slash dot dot, you do that because the notation for going up a directory, you can't just keep adding dots, you know? You, you can only go up one directory at a time. Okay. Calling os.path. And I don't know, is that a Windows thing? Someone introduced a three dot thing where you can do like dot, dot, dot and go up to a parent directory. Is that a Windows convention? I don't know. If there's a Windows, yes. I've only seen that as a mechanism to, for hackers to hide a directory. Because it's <laughs> ah. Ah. I know I saw it somewhere. I don't know where. But someone said, why doesn't dot, dot, dot go up to a parent director? I was like, I don't know. It's never done that. And they were like, yeah, that's the way it works for me. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> that me thing always throws me off, because I'm not everyone. Uh, so yeah, we have this. We can, we can, we can do that. And the, the key here is that whatever rel path is returning, that's what you have to CD into to get there, right? If you want to use rel path. So we have this thing, uh, os.path, uh, dot name path, right? And what does this do? Well, we talked about the nomenclature for having these different things, right? I call this the path, which is same, because that's what everyone else calls it, right? The file and the path. But you could also call it the journey, right? And there's one slight difference between journey and path, and that is this. The path could also be the path to the file, and the journey is telling you that's all a directory. So here's how this works. You're going to give it an absolute path to os.path.dernet, and it's just going to return you the directory name portion of that path. Right? Why is that useful? Okay, you have a absolute path to an image, right? and that's a directory with a ton of fucking images, and you want to find a different image in there, right? So how are you going to do it? You call os.path.dernet, and you give it that path to that image that you're looking at, and then from that path that it returns, you can find any other image in that directory. Okay, so now we're looking here and we have path, C Windows System32 calc, os.path base name, path, right? And we get calc.ese. So in this scheme, the base name is this. It's the name of the file. And the path is the directory name, right? And you'll see this base name a lot. Dir name, eh, that's a more of a Python name. It, I've seen it before too, but the base name is everywhere. So base name is the actual name of the file, and that term to me is somewhat pretentious because you could just say file name and it would do everything the same. Uh, if you need a path's dir name and base name together, you can just call os.path.split to get a tuple value with these two strings, like this. Okay, and this is also kind of useful. So we have a method for retrieving the base name, a method for retrieving the directory name, and a method for retrieving both at the same time. Right? And I know a lot of people are sitting there and thinking, oh my god, that's a lot of crap about paths. And here's the reality. You're going to forget all that stuff when you walk out here today. But you are going to remember that you can find out more information by going into help and looking at os.path. Right? That's where you'll find it all. And you'll relearn all of this. Is there a reason that all the path stuff is in its own sub-module? 
I, I think it makes things very easy. I mean, uh, I don't think there's a reason beyond that. They could put it wherever they want. They could have put it all in OS, but. Is there another OS stuff, something we should look yeah. at? Yes, there's a lot of things in there. There's, there's quite a few things in OS. There's, uh, let's take a look at it. I don't, I don't know them all. Uh, we're gonna go help OS. We were just there. And we have, How do you go up in OSX? Okay, I'm on a pager. Anyone know how to go up a page? There's no Shift page up. up button. I'll give you a hint. Just yeah. spacebar. I do have spacebar. Just spacebar. There's probably a page up. In the oh, that's yeah. Shift spacebar. Maybe uh, command up arrow. Function up is page up. Function up. Uh huh. The end of the hour. I think that one works. Down up. Uh, function up and down is page up, page down. There we go. Okay, uh, this is kind of like, I feel like this is almost a fair exchange. <laughs> You're now on a level playing field. I, 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 feel like, I, I feel like they're recording me to learn. Cool. Who's going to watch this on YouTube? Okay, so what we have here is, uh, we have, you said, what else is available for OS, right? There we go. So we have OS.path, OS.name, and then all of this stuff right here. And a lot of this is somewhat related to path, but it's not all related to path, right? Because we have this thing right down here, os.devnull. And these are, a dev null is a special file that sane operating systems have. And you can essentially dump all of your crap there. Do we have any systems administrators in here? We have part of, we have two, right? So what kind of stuff do you send to dev null? Uh, stuff that you don't want any output from. Basically. Look, you're, you're basically sending any output to trash. That's exactly right. And not just trash that you can take back out, like in the recycling bin. It's, you're just fantasizing it. It's a black hole where nothing comes back out. That's exactly right. Uh, <coughs> we, we, yeah, yeah, that's exactly where you want to send pineapple pizza. Uh, I like that. Pineapple pizza is <coughs> Pineapple pizza is that that is that's we need a dev no of life. I'm gonna say I have a destination for all of you <laughs> pineapple pizza fans. So here's the deal. The deal is uh, we, we we usually send things that are very loud and noisy there. Like sometimes you run across a program that program will whine about everything, and you'll be sitting to yourself, oh my god, why are you cluttering up my whole entire computer with all of that garbage? And you know it'll tell you something like warning, your system's low on memory. Warning, you know copying this to this directory or whatever. You, don't, you may not have control of the source code. With dev null, you can literally say all of that needs to go to the black hole. That's exactly right. So we usually use it to redirect logs, and we don't care what happens. And the better the system had been, the less they care about what happens. I'm quite sure. <laughs> You're not wrong. The amateurs that are new to the game, they like those logs. Everyone else, into the trash. OK. So. To, to answer that question, yes, there's a lot of things that OS does, uh, and and with varying degrees of utility. All right, and that's cool because that's a learning experience for everyone. Everyone gets to see that I don't know everything OS does and how I figure it out, and that's what I want everyone here to do. I teach the method. User bin split os.path.set. This is a very pretentious way of saying split, right? With the path name. So what I said is with the path separator. We have, on Linux, we use one separator. On Windows, we use a different separator. If you don't know the separator, you can use this. But we already said that there was a method of splitting out the base name and the directory name. <coughs> what is that? Anyone remember it? When we want to split the base name from the directory name, what do we do? Uh, base name and directory name, or? Uh, 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 but but that, that's not quite enough here, right? Because we have os.path.split. Did you say path? Yeah, I didn't say dot. Okay, well then you're right. You're totally right. You're 100% right. You you use os.path.split. So os.path.split is going to return to you the directory name and the base name. But if you want to find out all of the directories there, by the way, I have been told that I could probably okay to sign for cPanel now. But I don't know from anyone that I could probably live this one. Uh, has anyone seen Marco? Yeah. He's, on the couch. He's on the couch. Yeah. And he didn't see the pizza guy walk in? Is he sleeping on the couch? <laughs> he was awake when he walked past him and left him. 
He was looking for the pizza guy. I think he passed out from shock. The pictures we shared from the dear for a Oh, you know what? Hold on. I yeah, I don't wanna I was gonna slack him, but then I if I old tab to the slack, then everyone gets to see what we say, and that just sounds like a great way to get me in trouble. Because it's all being recorded. And the internet doesn't forget. You're you're all you're always live now. I'm, yeah, that's right, I'm always live. I had to, to get used to it. It's something weird to get used to because you're always like, you know, did you know what was on my desktop when I was back, you know, and all that kind of crap. It's it's a mess. Did, did it, it's it's I wish that was it because I'm that's on you know the um, the thing is did you see the the, the thing about Beto? Did anyone see what that is? Like, oh, yeah, did you catch that? Yeah. The one of the cult of the dead cow. Yeah. yeah. Here's here's how you know. I want everyone to know just how fucked they are with the internet and your history, right? They, they I Marco was downstairs. Yeah. <coughs> I did message him. He's coming down. Uh, what they did is they 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 found they found evidence that Beto, who he, he I, I really think well, that he it just it came out to his advantage. I don't think this is at all. He said it in an interview. Yeah. That's what that's, yeah. they got it out of him by asking him the question. I don't know how it started, but now they have like pictures of him, and they have him at conferences, and they have him. At, but this stuff happened in like the early '90s. It's like 1991. You know, you're talking about like super, super early stuff in '93, <laughs> and he was actually associated with this group called the Cult of the, the, Cult of the Dead Cow, which is probably the first hacker group outside of academia, right? Not the first hacker group, but the first one that probably ran outside of academia, and he he was you know busted or whatever in it. Who cares? Uh, but yeah, I have come to this conclusion. If they can dig up that shit from 91 to 93 and they have his old pictures taken with the old cameras that had floppy disks in them, <laughs> yeah, it's gone for all of us. You know, they, they say, like, they're like, don't let those drunken pictures of you show up on Twitter as if, you know, it, even if you stop now, they didn't have stuff like a decade ago. Okay, so you have some other stuff here. os.path.journame. Uh, Calc file path, right? And os.path uh, base name calc file path, and we're going to get both of these, right? Oh, this is, we've already done this. <coughs> Here's what I was showing you. Let me get back to the point. I was showing you that we have this thing called uh, path.split, right? Which we were using right here, os.path.split. And that is distinct and different from string.split. So don't let that confuse you. I wanted to draw that out. When we come down here and we say string.split, Right, and we give it os.path.set, that's no different than any other form of string.split we saw. Right, so do you guys remember how string.split works? We can take any string, we can take any string, and I can say hello, uh, m world, m hlug, and then I can say dot .split, and I can give it something, like m, and what do I get? I get, a, I get an array with three strings, hello, world, hlug, right? That string dot split takes a string and it takes a delimiter and it returns an array of strings that are split by that delimiter, right? There's nothing special about it. Now, what they're saying to you is, what if I gave you something like this? Actually, it should be something like this. Right, now I have a string here, user local bin, and what I want to do is I want to split it. So I can get all the directories out of it. Or here, user local bin <laughs> echo, right? That's my user version of echo. And I want to find out all of the stuff about this. How do I split that? Well, what they're telling you is, if you want to know how to split it, you can use this thing called os.path. What was it, dir sep? Sep. Sep? Just sep? That's what it says. OK, that's it. Just sep. That's easy. Right? And then it's going to break that up to all of the different directories and file components there for you. So we have root, user, local, bin, echo. Is there a reason why you wouldn't just use the uh, separated by the backslash? Yes, because if you separate it by a backslash, it won't work on your Windows machines. 
And if you use os.path.sep, when you take this file and you copy it to Windows, and you give it a Windows path, it'll work. So right now we have a Unix path and a Unix path separator, if we did this, right? Yeah. Let me show you. Let me give you a case in point. Let me make it very clear for you. We have, nope, let me make it even clearer than that, because that doesn't <laughs> work. There we go. That is a Unix path and a Unix path separator that works fine. Here's the problem. You code that Unix path in there, you ship this out to someone with Windows, and then they type in this. That's how it looks like on Windows, right? Now you didn't get the effect you wanted, right? So you got a lot more of the functions. You did. That's quite on good. Yes. Is there a difference between splitting with the OS path separator and using OS path split? There is not. No. They do the same thing. Yes. OS path dot split will only separate the um, dir name and the file. Yes, yes, no, he's right. I'm wrong. OS dot path dot split only separates dir name and base name. And, and if I use string dot separate, I get all of the components. That's exactly right. Good catch. Good catch. And I think there's one other catch to that. And that is that OS, that the string dot separator, right, if there's nothing to the left, you, the first element's going to be empty, right, because there's nothing before the delimiter. So when you say string split and you say on forward slash and there's nothing to the left of it, it returns an empty string. Right, so that'll also maybe throw your phone. Okay. Anyway, different ways to uh, get this cat. So, finding file sizes and folder contents. I guess the pizza guy got, got taken care of. Uh, but the pizza's cooling. Yes, it is. <laughs> Show of hands if you want to do pizza now while it's hot. We're doing pizza now, while it's hot. See you in whatever. Enjoy the pizza unless you like pineapple, in which case I hope it kills you. All right, so uh, we had a question during the break about how do we find out resources for Python. I am a huge fan of looking at the official resources for everything. Uh, right now we are not using an official resource. We are using a book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python that has nothing to do with Python proper, but it's an excellent book, and it's a copy left book. There are other books. Previously, but. <laughs> Previously, we, we did Think Python, and that was not a very good book. If you want to know about more resources, though, about how to become a good beginner in Python, there is an actual page that is maintained on the Python.org site called Beginner's Guide to Python. Uh, I would suggest checking this out, right, and making sure that your bases are covered here, and that you've at least viewed this stuff, right? Because this is what Python defines as a beginner level Python programmer. And something else here, I want everyone to see this. This is a Mac. What is it doing when I'm scrolling? It's tearing in like six places. My old IBM ThinkPad did not do that. That's interesting. I don't, I don't know. Is well, it tearing well, on the screen itself? Well, the reason, yeah. the reason it might be is we're coming out at 24 frames per second at my request. So that's going to probably affect that. I'm all about giving you blame unless I can do it. <laughs> Okay, well, blame it on the MacBook. That's right, it's a MacBook. You're doing awesome. Okay, something is going wrong in technology land place, and we won't analyze it because we can blame Apple. Okay, uh, so where we left off, we were going through, and we are about to get into the world of fumble coding, which is fun. I skipped ahead to see how bad it would be and how much fun you're going to have watching it. And I think you're in for a surprise. Okay, we left off somewhere right here. Yes. 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 Okay. So we did this. We said that we have this thing here called file.split, I mean os.path.split, which is going to return to you a base name and a file name. No, a base name and a dir name. Base name and a dir name, I'm sorry. And we said that that is the, the path directory splitting parlance, right? We also said that there's string dot split, and I wanted you to keep that in mind that they're separate, because they both call them split. Uh, and when we do string dot split, we just give it a, a one character, right, or more than one character, and it knows how to do that, right? So here we're using the special <laughs> character, os.path.split, right? So that's, that's where we left off. We're done with that. Now we're going to get to some new things here. 
Now we're getting, previously when we did OS slash add, we were only manipulating text, more or less, right? That's all we were doing, and it's important to see that. We didn't actually, you don't actually have to go to the file system to run path.split or path.join, right? Because all of that is just a text operation, and we saw that. We had this thing called os.path.set, and we played with that, and that's a character. And we can do all kinds of things. We can split with that character, we can join with that, whatever. It's just text. What we're finding now, that there's some other things we can do with os.path. What can we do with os.path? Well, if you give it a path, you can do anything you can do with the GUI. And it's easier, at least if you're using OSX. So what does that mean? If you want to find out how big a file is, you can call os.path.getSize. What is it going to return to you? The size in bytes of the argument you give it. If we call os.lister, right, what are we going to get? We're going to get a list of the file name strings for each file in the path segment, right? Uh, and here's the catch. We had this question earlier, so it's worth pointing it out again. Uh, we said earlier, we had this thing os.path. Why is everything in path? And we said, oh, there's some other things that aren't in path. And we went to that really esoteric example of dev null, right? Where we can send into the black hole all the lines that we don't care about, because that's what programmers and systems engineers do. Here we have something else, os.lister. This is a lot more practical. We use this all the time. You have a directory, and it stores all of your images. And you want to know what, what, are, what images are inside of that directory. You can call os.lister, you provide it the path name of the image directory, and now suddenly you have in an array all of the images in that directory. Right? It's pretty simple. So here we have os.path.getSize, and we give to it cwindowssystem32calc.exe, and we find out right here that calc.exe is 776,192 bytes. What does that mean? Roughly uh, 776 kilobytes. Right? A little bit less than that, but that's it. Uh, OS.lister, we give to that C window system 32, right? And what do we get? We get the array here. And notice, these are all relative, they're file names. We're not getting the absolute path, we're just getting the file name. So what are you going to need to make sense of that file name? You're either going to have to be in that directory, which you're not, and there's no assumption that you are, or you're going to have to have the path that you provided to os.lister. Because otherwise, those files could be anywhere. Right? So you, you're going to have to use this and this to make sense out of it later. And that's, that's all there is to it. Now, OK, so we know how to get the file size, and we know how to get which files are in the directory. How do we find out the size of the directory? Well, we have this excellent piece of code right here that can do that. Right? Total size equals 0. We start off and we say there's nothing in there. And we say for file name in os.lister, and we give it this file name, C Windows System 32, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to take total size, mm -hmm. and we're going to add to it the os.path.getSize, and then all of this crap, right? So what is this crap? This stuff right here, it's joining this, right? Now we just sent you the reason for it. I said to you when we looked at this, these guys are not useful without this, right? And that's what we're seeing here. We say OS.lister, system Windows 32, C, Windows, system 32. I'm just, sometimes I guess I speak faster than I can think, and it just comes out nonsense. C, Windows, system 32. And we use it again right here, os.path.join, C, Windows, system 32, file name. We're using them both together, and that's what I want you to see. All right? Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, we see head nods. Head nods are good. Yes? Will that recursively... Go through the directory? Excellent question. Answer, no. Okay. Right. So what did he just ask? And that's a fantastic question. Uh, I don't want to get into recursion yet, but we will uh, eventually. So it might as well cover the base. We have a concept here of a hierarchy, right? Now, I'm going to remember this, and I'm going to try to copy it, because I'm going to not monkey around to get back to it. I want to go back to the visual display we had earlier. Okay. Here's a visual display. We have C, bacon, fizz, we have a file, we have another file, we have another directory, we have a file, and we have a file. Right? C, bacon, and eggs, these are two separate directories. They are all in the C drive. If I want to find out what's in the C drive, and I call listers on the C drive, what am I going to get? Bacon, I'm going to get bacon, 
I'm going to get eggs, and I'm going to get spam. That's what I'm going to get. Now, what will I not get? Subfolder, subdirectory. I won't get fizz. I won't get spam here. I won't get spam here. And I won't get spam here. Why? Because os.listers does not recurse into these, right? There is no way to do that for a computer without it actually recursing into that directory. It has to say, OK, I know what's in this directory. Now I need to find out what's in the other directory. At some level, it has to tell the computer, I need to know what's in that directory. I need to know what's in that directory. There is no system call that says, I need to know what's in everything underneath me. And that process, we call that traversing into the directory, right? OK, directory traverse. And by the, I've never heard that word outside of that in context. I don't even know what the hell it means. But yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're going through the structure of data. Trying to set the hierarchy. Is it specific to a hierarchy or a structure of data? I thought you were an English guy. Well, to traverse. I always thought of the, the folder structure as a hierarchy of. We have we do have an English guy here who knows every word in the English language and Russian and Swedish. Here, <laughs> my friend. To traverse is to iterate. To enter. Iterate. To iterate. To iterate. Okay. Traverse and. is basically to walk. You can traverse things that are not hierarchical. Like a right. Old. That's what I thought. But how could you use traverse outside of a data object in a computer program? Like I, if I wanted to say. I'm going to traverse through all the offices today at CPanel. Does that make sense? I think so. Yes. You can yeah. traverse the parking lot. Yeah. 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 You can traverse the ocean. Park. Sound like you, can traverse you can traverse the ocean. You can traverse the ocean as long as you've got a ship. There we go. So there, there we go. <laughs> okay. That's from from my, my my new children's book. When every word I know is from a computer program. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so yes, good point about that. All right. So we have this other thing here called os.path exists. All right, that's first. Real quick, uh, yes. Uh, os.path that get size doesn't work on directories, does it? No. Okay. No. Because I'm getting a return, but it is 192 bytes for my users directory. So. Yeah, I got 4,096 for one of my directories. I think it's so, just the so I will contents, answer. Right? I will answer both of yeah. these things, but then we're not going to we're not going to address this further. What you're getting is actually, I believe, the page size on disk, and what you're getting actually is, I think, the entry in the inode table, something like that. But we're not. That, it, the point is, it's useless, right? Don't ask for the size of a directory like that. Uh, okay. So here's what we're doing here. We have os.path that exists, and we we give it a path, right? And what that path does, and if I'm wrong, by the way, you can interject and say I'm, I'm being an idiot, and that actually does mean something. But I, I think that I called both of those right, and I just don't want to go into the hairs of it. Okay. It means something the system is not to you. What? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. OS.path.exists with a path tells you whether the file exists. That is useful. We do that a lot as computer programmers. Why? Sometimes you start things up, and we say when that thing is running, we need you to write to this file. Right, to say that this thing is running. It's a server. Right? Usually those servers write to that file and they say, this is my process ID. I'm running. Let me give you a case in point. How many of you have used an editor and you've edited the same file and your editor came back and said, what in the hell are you doing? You've pretty got me open here. <coughs> have you ever seen that in your editor? Okay, what that is actually doing is when your editor opens that file, it is writing a file somewhere and it's saying, this is my ID. This is what I'm doing. These, sometimes it'll even say, these are the changes I've made. And then when you open up the editor again, it says, does this file exist? If the file exists, tell the user you're already running an editor. right? That's what we do there. That's an exist test. Something is creating a file, which says the editor is running. Something else is seeing if that file exists. We have this something here called os.path is file. That's simple. You don't know whether or not you have a file or directory. As we just found out, asking for the size on a directory doesn't make a damn of sense. So is file will tell you whether or not the thing you've got is a directory or a file. And if it's not a file, you don't want to ask about its size. You may want to go into it, but you don't want to ask about its size. You also don't want to try to write to it. You don't write to a directory. That doesn't make much sense. Evan, that example you gave where you're writing a file for the see if something's running, would you call that a semaphore by any chance? Uh, you, what if it's memory, but you want in this context? Okay. We call it a PID file, a PID file. And I'm sure there's a Wikipedia page on that, because there's a Wikipedia page on everything. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, some of 4s are specifically something else. Uh, okay, so we have os.path.isdir too. It's just the opposite, right? If something's not a file, it may or may not be a directory, right? For bonus points, what else could it be? Device. It could be a device. That's one thing. That's are you, you want bonus? Anyone know another example? Simlink. Simlink. That's that's the one I was looking for. Simlink would be a great example. Most many file systems that don't suck have a notion called a simlink. And what is a simlink? A simlink is a file that points to another file. Yeah, Jessica. Um, not a question, but we're not streaming. Like, nobody can see the stream. Aha. Uh -huh. So, I just wanted to. Is it streaming? That's news to me. I don't check it when I'm rolling when doing this because we're running dead on Wi-Fi. Aha. Uh -huh. oh, we, we will look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Did you get that from a Facebook message or from Discord? Discord. Uh, Discord. That is awesome. Someone is watching the stream. <laughs> well, they want to watch the stream. <laughs> they're not watching the stream. <laughs> but that means that Robert got us. A, do I even know? Do I know them? Um, S F Gur. I don't know. S F Gur. The cool thing is they're actively not watching the stream. That's it. They're actively not watching the stream. I I I I like to think that I have at least what I mean. How many fans does uh, does Kim uh, have? I, I, I gotta have at least that many. Box or a silly? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. I mean, Trump's got like 50 million followers on Twitter. That means I must have 60 million. Maybe it's not active. Okay. So we have uh, OS .path exists, right? This is essentially telling us what the files exist. This is very simple. I'm not going to be labeled at this point. The point here is, is that we have other things that are not files and directories, and while we won't usually cover them, especially as beginner level programmers, it's important to know that they exist. You can have a file that simply says, I am that file over there. It's called a symlink. You can do different things with it. You can follow it or not follow it. That's a great example. You can have a device, right? Some computer systems will, will expose other things like files. We talk here, one, and I will use this as an opportunity because sometimes I get criticism for not doing it. One of the very, very cool things you stand to gain by learning to use Linux is that everything is a file. All right, let me take this opportunity to say that if you are a beginner level Python programmer, you will know how to do everything we did today. You will know how to open up a file and into a file. If you know how to do Linux, that is all you need to do to communicate with your kernel. That's why it's cooler than Windows, and it's more <laughs> friendly. You're only a beginner level programmer, and you can find out how many cores your computer has, and how many CPUs your computer has, and how many packets it sent out on the network interface. And I have this little geeky ass light on my ThinkPad, because it was built in 92 or whatever, and it's because the keyboard didn't have backlights back before dinosaurs, so there's an actual flashlight built into the computer, and I can see whether or not it's on by reading whether or not a file has a zero or a one in it. Right? So if you don't have, if you don't know how to make an API call and call in a header and learn how to use the Windows API, that's all advanced computer programming shit, none of which we're going to cover in this class. What you can do is you can read from your kernel as if everything was a file. And that's the beauty of Unix and Linux, is that everything is a file. We communicate like that. So it's very simple. Right? Every that's the, the number one smart ass question I get is. Well, I know you guys are Linux group. What do I get if I install Linux? There's your opportunity. It's all in proc, tons of files, go read them. Uh, and, and this is enough. You'll, you'll figure it all out. OS.path.exist, D, false. OK, boring. Next. Uh, OK, so here's something interesting. And uh, by the way, this is one area where I find the Python help to be very shitty. Uh, you have this function called open. This is a core function. We can find out what this function does. This function returns a <coughs> file object, right? OK. Now, if you want to find out information about this file object, what do you do? Dun, 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 Call read on it. What? Call read on it. Call read on it. Well, if you want to find the help information for the file object, oh, what do you do? Oh, help. Uh, okay. help or help on the object? Yeah, you want to find out what this file object can do. Open is going to return a file object. And what can you do with the file object? Help. Uh, Help what? Uh, it's OK, here's the problem. Python doesn't make this part easy for you. And I don't know how else to tell this to you. Uh, this is a pain in the butt for me in Python. 
If you want to know, and by the way, if anyone knows the answer to this, correct me. Because I don't know how to do it yet, and I assume it can't be done. But I, that's not to say that you know, no one is smarter. If you call open, you get a file object. The file object can do all kinds of cool stuff we're about to see. If you want to know what a file object can do in Python, you have to create one first. And we'll see that in a little bit. Then you can provide it to health and find out what that file object does. We're going to go through that. But the point here is, is that we have a function called open. And when we call this function, we get something back, a file object. right? With that file object, we can read or write. Those are two things we can do. But if I ask you what else we can do, you can't figure it out without creating one. Get back to the point. We can close the file by calling the close method. So now we know that there's three things we can do to a file object. We can read, we can write, and we can close it. Right? So opening files with the open function. We can say here, hello file, open, and then we give it a path, right? An absolute path or a relative path. It doesn't matter to Python. And at no level does it care. And what it's going to do is it's going to open that file and it's going to return to us a file object. In this case, hello file is our file object, right? Now, after we have a file object, can we figure out what it is by calling help? Yes, then we can. Right, so let's come down here and let me show you what I'm talking about. Oh, if I'm smart enough to use a Macintosh, Macintosh, Macintosh. Okay. Aha, here's what I did. This is what it looks like to find the help out on a file object, right? We're going to create a file. We're going to say open foo2. I'm going to try to make that bigger. There we go. OK. We have, we're, we're and now we're, there we go. We, we're, we're creating a file. We're saying open foo2 for writing. That's what the W means. We're going, to see all, we're going to see a little more of the syntax in a second. But with this syntax right here, this is how you'd actually do it in Python. And now it'll tell you everything you can do on that file object, right? whether you can read from it, whether or not it's readable, whether or not all of that, flush. Now you can get all that information. So what we're doing here is we're saying hello file equals open, and we're opening the file, right? Now let's see how that works here on Linux. So I'm going to get out of this. By the way, who here knows what touch does? Side Great question, file. totally. Creates a file. Creates a file, that's right. Yeah. Touch creates a file. <laughs> wow, <laughs> bonus points, mega bonus points. We're, we're not, yes. That's the difference between a beginner systems admin and an intermediate systems admin. I don't know if he's at the stage yet where he throws away all of his logs, but it's, it's coming. Uh, <laughs> What's logs? So here's what we do here. Watch. We're going to go Python, right? And I'm going to, uh, that's not actually the right Python. We'll see that's Python 2.7. Python 3. Uh-huh. There we go. Okay, we're going to go here, uh, open, uh, foobar, for right. And what I want to do here is I want to name that a file. Now, I can go help file, and you will see that this file object that I created right here, this one right here, this one right here, there we go. This is what I'm doing. That's where that is. So this is nothing special, just the name of a, a file object, same my variable. Now I can say help file and I can find out more information about it. I'm trying to drill this into your head. I know I'm belaboring this point, but you've got to learn to use help. Now if I hit file and I try to show it in the REPL, you're going to see here, it says io.textio wrapper. I'm not going to cover it in detail, but that's just like it follows an interface. Hold on. It's wrapping text, right? There's this thing, text, underneath that file, and it's going to tell you something about it, right? IO is it's a, it's an acronym you'll see it all the time in computer programming. I want you to hear it, input, output, right? So that's what that means. When you see IO, that's what that's referring to. So what can we do with it now that we have this file, right? We have this file we've opened for writing. We can write to it. Uh, what we can do here is we can also read from it. What they're doing is they're reading first. So let's come back here. We're going to put out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to echo into foobar. Hello, hlog. 
and streamers. And we're going to paste that out. We're going we're gonna to redirect that, rather, to foobar, right? So this is the syntax in the command line. I'm just showing you some basic systems administration stuff. We're not going to get too sidetracked with this. But this is a method of saying, I want to put all of that stuff to this file in foobar. And then there you can see. So what I did is I said, dump this, hello, hlug and streamers, into this file foobar. This is called the redirection operator. I'm sending that to a file. I'm essentially creating a file with this stuff in it. Now what I'm doing is I'm saying cat, which is essentially print that file out on the screen, and you're seeing all of that content right here. And if I was in an editor, right? How do you get ls from the two exclamation points? That's what that command does when you just put on a command line. I don't know why it was in quotes. So I don't know why it. Uh, what do you mean? You would have had to escape it. <laughs> So what, it took um, the two exclamation marks and turned them into ls because that was the command you did right above it. Yeah, it interpreted your as the because it's thing. bash and that's the reason. There's nothing else to it. That's just yeah. Ed, oh, I was just going to say the same thing. Yeah, it's the way uh, bash works. Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! Happens to be an alias in bash to the last command right? Yeah. If you do single quotes, it's same. If you do double quotes, it's <coughs> insane. Right? Don't make sense out of it, it's bash, right? In bash, there's special variables. If you use double quotes, you get them. The point that I'm trying to make is not that, and I don't really want to go too much into it. What I wanted to show you is that that's how I create a file. So now I have this file, it has this content in it. If you're not used to any things that I'm doing, you can just see that when I look at the file, that's what's in it, right? Let's come down here, Let's we can even change this ls to a, a thing again, so it's insane. And now I know in the future to think about these things when I'm creating live demos. Okay, so you have this file foobar. We're gonna go Python 3, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say here open, well, let me say here my file equals open foobar is reading, right? Now when I look at my file, again, when I look at it the right way, I can't type on this keyboard, I get text.io wrapper. Now if I call my file.read, right, we see the contents of that file. And that's how simple it is to read and write to files. And if you're using Linux, that's how simple it is to read from your kernel, because mm. right? everything is a file. So that's it. That's all you got to do. Now you know the contents of that file. OK. Files are very simple. That's why when we said I.O. means input output, it's one way to get something from a, a, a store, to read it from the file, and it's one way to write to that store. Right? Every other way you can do it as a programmer is more complex. There's nothing simpler, no simpler way to store to a, something Persist, that persists in using a file. Okay. Uh, so here we have again, we're, we're taking here and we're saying sonnet file and we're opening this. Oh, what is Mac doing here? No idea. Uh, sonnet file, well, let's make that a little bit bigger. There we go. We're opening uh, this file, sonnet.29.txt, and we say sonnet file.read lines, and what do we see? We see a listing of lines, right? Now, I have taken the liberty, doo -doo. let's see if I have that file, maybe, yes, uh, uh, let's go here, automate online materials, ls, Okay, there is no sonnet file in the official materials. That's okay. Uh, there's a file here, and essentially when he calls read lines on it, the difference between read lines and read is read is going to give you one block of text with everything in that file. Read lines is going to split that text on a new line. Right? So when you when you have four line breaks in that file, sonnet file.read lines will say when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, new line. And then we have another string here, right? And then we have another string here. And I don't know why those aren't in quotes. There's, a, there's actually an error in this book here. Oh, hold on a second. I want to make sure there's an error in that book. There's definitely an error in this book. Does anyone know why that's in there? Am I right to say that? Yeah, no open quote. There's no open quote. That's an error, right? What is he doing there? Let's take this, and I'm going to actually show you his code. 
But where's the first quote here? In yeah, the West. Same, but right. Um, and this this should even be escaped. Yeah, if that's a web page rendering, the quote may have been smaller due to formatting rules, depending upon how he set up that display. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. I mean it, it definitely could be a rendering problem. But it's a it's a bug in the website or it's a bug in the text, one of the two. That's yeah. not correct. Yeah, and I like they were the same problem with the last two lines too. Yeah, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create a directory in his called fix. And by the way, here's extra points for anyone. This is an open Creative Commons book. Here's your, if you're starting, you're aspiring to become a computer programmer, or you're writing one of our docs, go find out where his book is hosted on GitHub, fork it, and fix it for him. I think his website is also open, you know? It's just a, that'd be a, a decent little thing you could help him out with. Okay, so what I, I have this directory called fix, and I'm gonna create this thing called uh, sonnet.txt. And I'm going to paste inside of it all of that stuff, which is what he's looking at, right? And we're going to write it. Let me delete that last line. Now I have inside of Sonnet, you can see all the text right there. I just put it out on the console using the command cat. And we're going to go Python 3. And I'm going to go uh, my file equals open. Sonnet.txt uh, is reading. Now if I look at my file, I see that weird cryptic IO file thing. But if I go my file dot read lines, it should be yes, yes, read lines. We can see here that I get I get an array back. And this time, let's see if I can. Oy, why did I do that? My file dot c. Don't worry about that one, just pretend like you never saw it. There we go. Okay, recovery from a live coding blunder. We see here now we have, we've called my file the relines and we see that we have in the first line is up at the top and you'll see the trailing new line. It keeps it there, right, for processing. We can see the second line here. You can see the third line and the fourth line, they're all there. We've taken a block of text and we split it by lines. And I'll tell you why that's useful. It's useful because every time you see text, right, and you're parsing it as a computer programmer, one of two things are gonna enter into your mind. This is all a block, or each line is significant. Usually when it comes to actual prose, the block is totally fine, right? Because the enters don't make a difference. But if you're reading something like code, or a report, or a receipt, or anything like that, the new lines definitely make a difference, right? You look at a receipt from someone, and you have items, item, item. Every line is a new item. That's why. You can say, for each item in myfile.readlines, right? So I could do something like this. We're gonna go back, ignore that. I'm not explaining it. We're gonna say for each item in my file, read lines. This is an item, what in disgrace with, so now you've seen that I'm taking each line and I'm doing something special with it. And we could do that just as if they were in lines that are received. Okay. So, we do here, uh, <coughs> we open the file and now we have learned how to open files, we can read to them and we can also read the lines from them. And we have this other method here which is gonna be writing to a file. How do we write to a file? Well, we saw when we read from the file the second argument was R, which means read. The second argument could also be W, which means write. And if we want to write to a file, we open that, we get the file object the same way, using open. We just provide you with the write flag, and then we say bake and file down write, and we can give it text. And what it's going to do is take this argument here to write, and put it out to that file, and return to you the amount of characters or bytes that it wrote. Right? So if I say baconfile.close, right, that file is now on the disk and it has those files in it. I'm not going to show you this because you take my word for it, it's very simple at this point. Now here's something else. We have bacon file open, and this time we're giving it an A. So what does an A do? A pen. Here's my question. If I write to a file, let's say that I write to this file here twice, 
Bacon file write. I open this, I run this piece of code and this piece of code twice. What does bacon file have? Hello world. Hello world. Once. As a once. And hello world, hello world. Just hello world. Right? If you run that piece of code twice, you're going to get it once. Because what you're doing is, when you open the file the second time for writing, it's going to essentially destroy the old file. Overwrite. Overwrite. Exactly. Right? It's going to open up that file, you're going to lose everything in it, it's going to write all new contents to it. Right? So, this is the difference. Append is different. If I call this, this piece of code here twice, I'm going to have bacon is not a vegetable, bacon is not a vegetable, because it's going to be appending it. And by the way, you will see this everywhere in computer, science, in, in computer programming. Let me give you another case in point. Okay, I want to show you do, 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 this, right? If I do this, and I'm in this thing, and I say uh, echo foo, and I'm going to put this out the bar, what is that going to do? Anyone know? Good. It's going to create a file called bar with the content foo. That's exactly right. Right. So if I do this, you're going to see it. Now if I do it twice, what happens? Bar has one foo in it. But how many of you have seen this? Now if I do it, and I say cat bar, you're going to see two foos in it. It's because under the hood, it's all doing the same thing. Right. I'm just saying you'll see this. You'll see this if you're a systems admin. You'll see it if you're a computer programmer. You have two methods of writing to a file. One of them overwrites the file, the other one appends to the file. Right? Okay. Just to bring it all home. Bacon file dot close, bacon file dot open. Bacon, bacon read, bacon, bacon file dot close. That's very simple. Print out content. The point here is that Mac is okay. The point here is that when I say when I close the file, I don't lose the contents I've read. I lose the ability to read future contents without reopening it, but I don't lose anything I've read. Right? Okay. Saving variables with the shell module. Okay. Yes. In fact, we did this last time too. This is always fun. There's a there's a module in Python called Shell, and I think there's even another one. Pickle also does this, right? Yes, Pickle last time. So what's the difference between Shell and Pickle? Anyone want to take a guess at that one? So I don't know the answer. answer. What's up? You may know it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, this is a very basic thing here. There's this thing that we can do is we can import this module called shelf, right? And what we can do is when I have this shelf file, I can say shelf.open my data, cats equals this array, shelf.file cats equals cats, shelf.file close, right? And if I run these commands, let's go ahead and do that. So we created this file, and it's essentially going to open this thing, my data, right? You'll see a file here called mydata.dv. You can see here that what it is stored in it are the very same things from the array. Zofi, Polka, and Simon. So what it's doing is it's giving you an interface to store a Python data structure. When you shelf something, you take in a data structure, and you allow Python to write the whole thing out to the file and then read it all back in. Let me tell you why that's important. I'm going to play it with you a different way. We've talked about reading whole files, and we've talked about reading lines. But how do you read and write data structures? How do you read and write an array? How do you read and write a dictionary? You can read and write those types of things using shelf. Right? So you can import the module shelf, Python 3, <coughs> import shelf, well, no, import shelf, help shelf, and what you get here is manage shelves of pickled objects. There you go. It is the same thing as pickled uh, okay, It uses pickled. It uses You pickle. have a shelf. 
pickled things. We have a shelf of pickled things. And that's, that's the cute mnemonic, okay? When I started this thing, I said, what is the difference between this and pickling? Python calls pickling taking an object, right, and making it a series of something you can write and read, right? The Python has something called shelf, which apparently takes these pickled things and writes them to a file. Okay, so then there you go. Uh, and there's nothing, nothing too special about that. Why is this cool? This is cool because it allows you to take complex things. Like let's say you had a dictionary, inside of it there's a dictionary, right? We've already seen these things in practice. Watch this. If I say this, uh, A equals foo bar, right? We can see A. That's very simple. There's one key, foo, and there's one bar, bar, right? Key value, foo bar. I can say A, foo, close it, and I get bar. But I could also do something like this. B equals, and then I could say foo, and then I could say uh, hello. Now I have an object with an object in it, right? It, there's a dictionary and a dictionary inside of it. To access world in that case, I would do this. E, the first key, and then I would do the second key. And I'm only showing this again because we've already seen it. I'm not going to go too far into it, right? This was early, way earlier on. I can get world back. Now I have a dictionary with a dictionary inside of it. Pickle takes care of all of that crap, right? So if you want to take something like this that's slightly more complex, you can write this thing out to a file and then read it back later. No more complexity to you. Open a file, shelve your, your, your stuff, your data structure. It takes care of everything. OK. Is there any questions on that? Did anyone do this beforehand? I skipped it. They have so much confidence in the new lecture in front of them that no one has to do anything. They just come and the osmosis kicks in. Everyone leaves smart. I love it. <laughs> shelf file, shelf.open, we give it my data. We say the type of shelf file, right? Type is going to give us that, that thing. If we would have given type the my file from the file object we had earlier, we would have got that text I go wrapper thing. So there you go. Shelf.db.file name, right? And we can say here shelf file cats, and what do we get back out? We get back out this stuff. This is the opposite of it, right? So let's go back to the thing that we had, and what we're going to do is copy this and just show you the other side. So look here. When we did D, do, 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 okay. We created this file just now. We imported shelf. We said shelf file equals shelf that open. We said cats are these three cats. Then we stored the cats into the cats key, and we closed it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do the opposite of that. We're going to take the inverse of that operation. We're going to say. We're not going to say any of that because it just crapped out on me. One second. Shell file. Command C. Okay. Where did it go? There, there it went. Okay. Command V. There we go. Oh, import shelf. Now we have that thing, and if we say shell file cats, we have our cats. So you see what we did? We stored into cats key an array with three cats. That was a shell file, and we closed it. We started it again. This time we said shell file open my data. Notice we didn't define cats anywhere. We, this cats is not in this program at all. We gave it the file name my data, right? And we told it we wanted the cats thing back out. My data is on the disk. When we called the shelf the first time, we actually wrote a file, and I showed you this. We wrote a file, and that file is right here. MyData.db. We're reading back from that, and we're, we're actually finding our array inside of it. So if I come down here, this is exactly what's happening. We're opening my data, and we say we want the cats array. OK. Moving on. Sharing variables with pprint.p format. So if we look at the stuff that we're doing with Python, right? it's not always pretty when we print something out. 
right? And I'll show you what we mean by that. If we take a look at, and for people, that's, yeah, let's, let's see this here. take something with Python and we say we say uh, a one two three right we have the option here to print a well no I need to assign it first a equals one two three we have the option to say a when we get this back this is pretty printing for you if I say print a right we get it back like that too there's some cases though where that becomes more complex. And rather than going into them, I'm gonna show you what we're doing here. We're just taking this. I don't actually know any of those cases off my head, but that's what we're doing. Cats equals that, and if I say cats, I can see it like this. And there's a module called pprint, and you can go pprint, P format cats. Right? And what it's going to do is return all of this stuff here as a string. Okay. And the reason why it's going to do that is I can take this string and write it to a file. And later on, you can read that same code back, you can run it, and get that same data structure. So that's actually what's happening. If you if you want to print it, it's going to send this thing here to the output of your screen. Right? If you want to capture the output, you can use pprint.pformat. So now I can actually say pprint.pformat string equals pprint.pformat. And now when I print it out, I can see that string. Whereas before, when I say print cats, I have no method of capturing that. Right? If I say here, <coughs> string 2 equals print cats, I should have nothing. Nothing. So the, here's the deal. The deal is this. When you're printing something out, it goes directly to the terminal, to the output source, right? If you want to save that and put it out to a file instead, you can use pprint.pformat. Okay? And then we write to it, cats equals the output, and we close it. All right, when we import cats, right, we can import that as a variable. Now notice up here what we're doing. We say cats equals, right? I'm gonna come back to the code that we wrote and I wanna show you what, what's happening here. We have this, string equals cats. Now if I look at this, I can see the very same thing. What does this look like to you? Uh, cats equals, What does that look like? Anyone want to give it a shot? It's a variable declaration. It's like a variable declaration. That's right. It looks like totally valid Python code, right? We'll that looks around. like totally valid Python code. So we have a variable cats. We have an array. We have this syntax here to create the dictionary. That's totally valid Python code. And what happens is if we take that totally valid Python code and we put it in our own module, we can use it later. So that's what they're showing you now. They're showing you the very seeds of creating your own module, right? So he's creating a module that he can actually use at a later point in time. He's creating that module, though, not by writing the code, but by generating the module himself. And then all you do is you say import cats, and you can look in your variables right there. This is the one that we declared, cats, right? It's under, notice the syntax. Be very cautious about the syntax. <coughs> Import the module name, mycats. There's a file in called mycats.p py. It's it's not py. It's not pm. It's it's pyc if it's compiled. It's regular py. It's just py. It's my mycats.py, and you can say mycats.cats. 
and get the actual names of the variables inside of that module. That's what's happening. Okay, there you go. So you, the, the file, the only catch here is that that file that you create has to be .py, and then Python can just simply import it. Okay. So generating random quiz files. This is the project here. And here's what I will not be doing again, because it was such a horrendous mess last time, even though I did paste the code from the last time we live coded shit, I pasted that in the Discord, right? And that was that time where we were supposed to pivot the table, and I could not wrap my head around doing this in baby talk, which is what essentially was learned at that point. And uh, yeah, so I have now found the source code for this type of stuff, and we're just gonna explain that, because it's really better. <coughs> Create 35 different quizzes, creates 50 multiple choice questions for each quiz in random order, provides the random answer and three random wrong answers for each question in random order, writes the quizzes to 35 text files, writes the answer key to 35 text files. That's what we're doing. We're creating a quiz generation mechanism. You give it fake answers, you give it real answers, you give it questions, you get test tanks, and you get answer keys. Got it? That's what we're doing. Okay. That's the Mario. Okay, S store the quiz data in a dictionary, right? Random quiz generator.py. The way this book is structured, all of this code is available when he starts it like this online. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Import random. We already went through random before. What does random do? Gives you random numbers. Gives you random numbers or random list elements. Remember that too? Right? So we have here capitals and we're giving it a dictionary. You can see Alabama, Montgomery, Alaska, Juneau. These are all capitals, and these are all the states. Mm -hmm. States are our keys, capitals are values. And then what we say here is generate 35 quiz files. Four quiz in range 35, right? So range here is going to be an iterator. It's gonna return 35 different things, right? And every time we loop through it, we're gonna set a quiz number to one of those things. So range is a sequence. Quiz numbers is actually the thing inside of the sequence. Now here's the deal. For those of you that remember, because we've done this multiple different times, range is generating a special thing, right? If I want to get all of those things back, is, ah, don't even have to finish the question. Nailed it. That's right, list. You would wrap range and list. It's a very common Python idiom, okay? <coughs> Create the quiz file and shuffle the questions in order. Now it's time to start filling in those to-dos, okay? <laughs> Here's what we do. Four quiz in range 35. Now we're starting to fill it out. We say quiz file open, and we say capitals quiz S text. What is that S? That's exactly right. Okay, you're off You're off for the next uh, 30 minutes. You, you, you got this down pat. We're going to have to wake some other people up. Okay, capital quiz S. S is a placeholder for a string. What we provide to it on the other side is the value, right? So this and this together is a Python syntax for saying I want a, a string that says capitals quiz and then quiz number plus one. I want to show you how that works here really quick just to refresh your mind because we're all new. If I say this here, you do do. I say hello, S, and then I say S, and then I say world, right? I can even do like that, and do more. I get hello world. That's all that's happening there. We have a format string on the left-hand side, and we have the variable to fill it in on the right-hand side, right? So that's what this does. And then the only other thing that we have here is the right flag, right? So we're creating a file name. That's what we're doing here, and we're opening it up to right. Then we say answer key file, because remember we have to create an answer key for every test, equals capitals quiz answers and the same number .txt, and we open it up to write. Then what we do is we say quiz file .write, and we're throwing into it this name, and we're also two lines enter, date, two lines, period, right? So we're essentially starting it off with a place where students can write out their headers, right? So think of it like this, they give it to you, there's nothing in there. That's, that's where you fill it out as your student. My name is this, my date is this, I'm in the third period. Okay, quiz file that right. We have an empty string with one character, right? It's, a, it's a, actually, it's a space character, I should say. And what is this in this context? 
What's the word for it? If we have a string and we have a multiplication sign, what does it do? Concatenation. Repetition. Repeats. Repetition. 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 Ah, repetition. repetition. What do you say? Repetition, that's right. Concatenation is? Plus. Plus. Joining. Plus. Plus. You concatenate with plus on strings, you repeat with, with the, the uh, asterisk. So we're, say, we're saying, give me 20 spaces. That's what this is. You could write them all out, but here he's just being explicit. Give me 20 spaces, state capital quiz, form, and we're doing this again, right? The same nonsense right here, where we're saying, this is a format string, and this is what goes inside. So we say 20, face, 20 spaces, the state capital quiz, and then we have the form number, right? Okay. And then we put in two more spaces, two, two more new lines, rather. And what we're going to do here is we say states equals list capitals dot keys. Give me an array of all of the, the capitals, right? The keys for the capitals. What are the keys for the capitals object? We state. saw it. States. Exactly right. You look into capitals, you give it a state name, you get the capital back. So the keys are the states. So we want a list of all the states. Then we say random.shuffle. I said, what does random do? Generates a number. That's the number one thing that should come to your mind. What else can it do? It can shuffle a list. It's anything like that. So it's going to shuffle that list randomly. It's giving back in random order. Right? OK. Easy, easy. Now we're going to create the answer options. Right? For each question number in range 50, right? all we're doing here is we're saying we're going to generate a list again to 1 through 50. And if you want it to be in an array, you do. Popular Python idiom is list, right? List range to get that, that in a list form. We say here, correct answer equals capitals, and we give it the name of that state, right? Uh, wrong answer equals list, capitals.values, right? And then we say, essentially what we're doing is we're getting a right and a wrong answer, right? This capitals, we just created it, and it's in random order. And the correct answer, we're looking up, right? Then we delete the wrong answer. So we take out of the wrong answer, which is everything in scrambled up. We take one of them out. Why do we take it out? Because you don't want the right answer and the wrong answers. Yes, that's one good way to do it. But there's 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 one that's one interesting way to think about it. But here's another interesting way to think about it. If your wrong answer is always the same thing, you're going to have an, a, an a hit. You want the you want the the wrong answers mixed up. Right? But you don't want to keep using the same ones. So we delete from the wrong answer bank the correct answer. Wait, you were right. That what you said is dead on. We don't want the correct answer to show up in the wrong answer. So we delete from the wrong answer bank this. Okay. Then we print the wrong answers, right? We, we, we capture the wrong answers, we sample them, we want three of them. And we capture the answer options, which are the wrong answers and the correct answer, and we're shuffling. And we're going to see this in practice here in a second. Let's take it and let's actually look at this. Quiz. DDD. Oh, number one. Here we go. Okay. Put something, no? Random quiz generator, that's what it's called. No. I thought he had a full copy of this thing here. I don't even see it. You know what happened? Here's what happened. I moved it. I tried to import that into the thing here, and I did. And it came down here. Capitals quiz. Hmm. Yep, that's exactly what happened. It did work. <coughs> Whoever was helping me out with PyCharm earlier on in the day, that actually worked. That moved the file into the PyCharm directory. Fantastic. So uh, 
we have, sometimes you think something fails and it actually works, it's pleasant. So here's the actual code, right? Here's where we're generating these quiz files, you've already seen that. Here's the more complex stuff, this question number thing. Loop through all 50 states, get the right answer and wrong answer. We pull out the correct answer specifically. For the wrong answer, we take a listing of all of the answers, right? And then what I want to do is simply delete the right one, remove the right answer. Now I'm sampling, random sample is another method we've seen. So, so far we've seen a random shuffle to mix up the order and random sample to pull out a certain amount of numbers from it. We're random sampling the wrong answers to grab three of them, right? Then the answer options for that question equals the three wrong answers and the correct answer, right? So why are we putting the correct answers in brackets? Can anyone tell me? So you can add a list on the list. Boom. Because if you try to add a list and an item, you have a problem, right? You can add two lists together, and then it does that. It makes sense. And you can add two strings together, and it concatenates them. But if you want to add one thing to a list, you either have to push it, or they both have to be lists, and you can use the, the list concatenation. That's exactly right. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to shuffle the options, right? And we're going to write them out. Blank, what is the capital of blank, right? And we say, this is the question number. So the first thing is, question number, what is the capital of the state, right? Then we're gonna print out all of the options, and that's it. Answer key, file dot write. We're gonna write out the answer keys, write out the quizzes, and we close both of them when we're done. And I just ran this, and I didn't actually know it worked, but I think what it did, is one of we thought, here's what happened. We ran this earlier in the class, you guys didn't see it. And we had a little balloon that was pivoting, right? And I thought this shit just crapped out. And what it was actually doing was generating 35 tests and answers and pulling them into the IDE. That's what was actually happening. So when I was making fun of Mac again, that one it was actually doing something under the hood and not crashing. Okay, and then here's all of our, our question quizzes and, our, and our, our capitals quizzes, right? Capital quizzes and capital answers. Let's take a look at one of them here, and we'll show you what we generated. Here's the name, date, and period, like a student would get. Here's the name of the quiz. This is Form 35, so you know where to check it from. And here's all of your questions and answers, right? What is the capital of Oregon? Salem, Salt Lake City, Albany, or Oklahoma? Salem. Salem. Oregon's not all important. I don't know it. Joking. Uh, capital answers. We can look at capital answers. There's our answer, guy. Right? So that's a relatively short period of code that we have. I mean, we did that all today, right? So now you can generate something that creates a quiz. Now all we have to do is get jobs as elementary school teachers, and that will be tremendously useful. Okay. Uh, and we still have 30 minutes. Comment and shelf setup. <clears throat> Let's start our code by making a skeleton script with some comments and basic setup. Look at your code like the following. Python 3, mcb.tyw. Saves and loads pieces of text to the clipboard. We've already seen this once, right? We already did something. We, what did we use before? Does anyone remember the name of the module? Piperclip? Piperclip, right? Piperclip was the name of the module we used before. And that was a module that we added on through pip. And that was our first module that we installed that didn't come with Python. Right, so we said, we're gonna write something that allows us to write a password manager. You guys remember that task? And the password manager worked like this. We kept a list of all of our accounts and our passwords, and we wanted to give it the account name and then have that password copy to the clipboard. Then we could just go to the website and paste it. So you would say, Piperclip, you know, my Piperclip app, and then Chase or whatever. You would copy your banking password to the clipboard, you go right in and paste it. Uh, so now we're seeing something similar, I'm guessing. And again, here we have the same module, Piperclip, right? So this is an improvement, I'm assuming, over the, the thing that we just did, right? Let's take a look at this and then actually read it. Project multi-clipboard. So you can write a Python program to keep track of multiple pieces of text. This multi-clipboard will be named mcb.pyw, since mcb is shorter to type than multi-clipboard. The pyw extension means that Python won't show a terminal window when it runs the program. See Appendix B for more details. This program will save each piece of clipboard text under a keyword. For example, when you run pi mcb.pyw save spam, the current contents of the clipboard will be saved with the keyword spam. 
This text can later be loaded to the clipboard again by running multi-clipboard span. And if the user forgets what keywords they have, they can run list, copy list of all keywords to the clipboard. So essentially what we're doing is the same thing, except we're going to store the, the data in this shelf, right? So here's what we're doing. We have this method here to save the clipboard content. We talked about sys.argv before. Does anyone remember it? Anyone remember what sys.argv is? Command line arg. It's the arguments that you send to Python, right? So let's come down here and let's take a look at it. There we go. If I do import sys, and then I say uh, sys.argv, you can see nothing's there. If I come back to Python, right, and I say Python 3, hello, hlog. I, I actually thought that would work. That doesn't work. Uh, let's try this. Nope, that also doesn't work. You can't pass, Py you can't pass arguments to the REPL. That's what's happening. Annoying. Uh, right, so that's what we could do here. We could say here, uh, okay, I'm trying to see if any of them are useful for our purposes. Skip the first line of the import source, allowing use of non Unix forms. Let's try that, whatever. Python 3s. There we go. And now import sys and sys.argv. Okay. I fold on that one. We'll look at that later. What, what Python does, and not the REPL, but your scripts anyway, is how it'll work. We can take something here. Let's show you this. Test.py. And I can say import sys, sys.argv. And now what I do is I can see in that AR, in that, that ARGV three things, right? I have passed it here to Python 3, test.py, hello, and world. And you can see the first thing is the name of the script I'm running, the second argument is hello, and the third argument is world, right? What we're doing here is we're looking to see out of the three things that, out of the thing that we're running, we want to see whether or not I have three arguments. Right? That means that I'm passing two, and the first one is the script. Right? You come back and you look at what we did. We passed two arguments, hello and world, and we got an argu and a, a length of three here. So if we have a length of three, and the first argument is save, right? we have the name of the file, save, then what I want to do is store in the shelf the second argument, hyperflip.paste. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is if I have save, and then two things, I'm going to store in my shelf under the, the, the second thing I sent to it, hyperclip.paste. So here's how that's going to look. If I have something like this, python.thing, save, foo, right? What I'm actually going to be doing here is I'm going to write into the shelf under foo the result of paste, whatever's in the clipboard. So you're essentially give it an argument, and it looks at whatever's in your clipboard, and it stores whatever argument you give it with that value in the clipboard, right? And then if the length of the argument equals two, that means there's not two things I'm giving it, I'm just giving it one. Rather than save something, I just give it one thing, then it's gonna list keywords and load content. Okay, and we call them cbshelf.close. List keywords and load keywords content, Python 3, okay? We're adding to it now some things. If the first argument is list, rather than save, I say list, what does it do? Then what it does is it copies into the clipboard, right, the string of the list of all of the keys. So what are all of the keys for the MCB shell? That's gonna be whatever all of the crap is that we've stored in this clipboard, right? And we're gonna actually take it and we're gonna copy all of that stuff into the clipboard. So we have a file that file has a bunch of things we want to store in our clipboard vault, right? And when I call it with list, it's going to copy 
into the clipboard all of the keys from that file, right? And if the argument is one, right, and it's not list, then what does it do? It copies just that one thing. So we have three modes here. Let me show you how this, this is going to look. We have, we have uh, my file or script.py essentially, save foo. We have script.py list and we have script.py key. That's what we're doing. We're, we're covering those two cases. In the first one, we save into the vault for the key, whatever is in the clipboard. In the second one, we list all of the possible keys in the vault. In the third thing, we give it a key and it looks into the vault, finds out whatever the value is for that key, and it puts that in our clipboard. Does that make sense to everyone? This example could just be too boring or it could just not be presenting it right. I don't know. The clipboard vault thing was not a big hit the first time we did it, and now we're making it more complex. But that's what's happening. Okay, the password locker. Let's take a look at it now, and let's run it, and I'll show you how it works. mcd.pyw. Because this is it, mcd. So python mcd.pyw list. Oh, that's because I haven't installed this. pip3 install. Now you guys get to see the syntax again. When, if you ever see this, no module name Piperclip, it means you have to install that module. And we talked about that before. Piperclip is code we don't write, we just use. So now I've installed Piperclip, pip3 install Piperclip, and now I'm ready to rock. I can come back up, Python 3. No. Oh, that's because that's Python 2. Python 3. There we go. So I have the ability to say list. I have the ability to say save foo. I have the ability to say foo. Now here's the thing it didn't do. It didn't copy anything. Let's try this one more time. Save foo. Yeah. It copies it to your clipboard and you can paste it into something to see what That's it is. what's happening. Thank you, my friend. I'm expecting you to print it out because I am zonked. So here's what we're doing. We say save foo, and then what I'm doing is I'm pasting it, and I get the same thing. So let's do something more exciting with this thing, right? What we're going to do here is we're going to go uh, MCB list. We see nothing, right? Because it copies to your clipboard. The, the list of keywords. The list of the keywords is copied to the clipboard, too. So if I paste that, I get the array foo. Right? Let's take two things here, right? Let's do this. I'm on a site, and I see this. And I say, OK, I want to save all of this text. I can copy this. I can go over here. And we can say, into mcb.list, save. Save this for later. Right? Now if I say Python 3, mcb.py, list and I paste that, I see save this for later in food. You see how I just, what I did is I copied text from the, the thing, I copied this text, I came over here and I said save it as save this for later. Now when I list it, it copies that key, save this for later, and it shows it to me there. Now I can say here, Python 3, mcb.pyw, and I can say, just the name, save this for later, and now what's back in my copy buffer? All of that text, right? So it gives you the ability now to essentially, we can save whatever we want, it looks at our copy buffer, it saves it to the file, we can list, but when we say list, it doesn't print it out. It just simply copies the keys into our copy buffer, and we can paste it. And we paste it, we're gonna see this thing and whatever else we have. And if we actually wanna get this stuff back out, into our clipboard, we can just simply say what we've done here. We said, we called it with the key name, right? Which is here, Python 3 MCB, save this for later, right? And it's gonna copy that text passage back from our, 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 our database, our file, and paste that into our clipboard, or make it available in our clipboard for paste. All right, that's a tongue twister. Uh, and I think that's it. Summary practice questions. Do the, if you want to do the practice questions, do them. We'll go over them next week. Uh, if you want, if no one does them, I won't go over them, and we can just start the next chapter. For those of you that aren't aware, the next chapter 
is organizing files. So we're going to continue down this path, and we're going to talk about other things we can do with files that are slightly more practical, having seen the basics today. Very cool. Anyone have any questions? All right, we're done.